fake news. This is news you can trust. Checking facts and taking names. You're listening to the Babylon Bee with your hosts, Kyle Mann and Ethan Nicole. Yes, this is the Babylon Bee podcast, and this is Kermit the Frog with my friend, Squeaky Voice. Squeaky, Squeaky McCrackerson. Squeaky, <laughs> Squeaky McCrackerson. Oh, wow. <laughs> We're off to a good start here. Yes, we are. We're energized. Yeah. Because we just talked to Kevin Max from DC Talk. And you're going to get to hear that a little later on. Yes. It was such a good conversation. He was my favorite DC Talk guy. Yeah. Toby who? Yeah. Toby, Toby Whack. Whack. Yeah. Michael, wait. Wait. Who are you even who? talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did like him because I liked all like the, I liked how he sang all like, it was like R&B Kurt Cobain. He was like grunge, but like R&B. He's actually got a really good voice. He has a really good voice. Um, And yeah, we're going to talk about that amazing voice, those pipes of his. Yeah, DC Talk. I mean, it's a big part of a lot of our past. Yeah. It was a big part of our Christian upbringing for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, think you guys are going to enjoy this. In the meantime, we've also got a few stories we're going to talk to you about. And one of those has to do with DC Talk. So a lot of DC Talk, a lot of Christian 90s. This is the DC on. Talk episode. It's kind of a DC Talk episode. So uh, Ethan, you just went on a big road trip. Did you guys bump... Jesus Freak and New Thing and Supernatural oh, you know, the entire time. That's the sad thing about because I, I went on like a over 2,000 mile road trip with my family with four kids and uh, the sad thing about this day and age and technology is that we can't force the whole family to listen to the same thing anymore. Yeah. Like I listen to my music up on the oh. stereo but everyone's got their headphones on they're listening to all their different things they're watching movies they're watching YouTube on the road it's like can't we get a break from YouTube in this horrible world we live in? No. Yeah. We've got one of those DVD players in our van, like this, the, the five-inch screen that's in the middle and yeah. everyone looks at it. And it's a little disappointing because I want to share like some of my favorite music with my kids. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just watching Shazam, you know. Well, I bought again. one of those DVD players where you put two, two screens on the back of the two right, seats. Yeah. And it was so complicated to hook up, I couldn't get it to both play the same movie. And, they kept, and the seats didn't fit the thing they gave me, so... The screens ended up on the floor a whole bunch, and someone stepped on one of them and broke it. And <laughs> oh, jeez. So it was just a, it was a sham. Those things are a sham. Don't buy them. Yeah, we used to have those. It's like the, the aftermarket DVD player thing. The highlight, which I think we may have talked about in the DC Talk interview, was that we stopped at a little farm and stayed. We did like a whole bunch of Airbnbs in this trip. And one of them, they had like, they had like two donkeys, a pig, a bunch of chickens, and the pig bit my daughter, and that was very traumatizing. Didn't break the skin, but uh, it was horrifying. Has she started to exhibit any signs? She's of- afraid of pigs now. Like she thinks they're mean. She used to love them. It was her favorite animal. Her first like noise she learned how to make was she go uh, uh, like because she thought a pig noise was funny, and so it was pretty traumatizing for like her whole life to think pigs are so great. And then she got bit by one right in the arm. Yeah, well, I'm thinking maybe she's starting to exhibit some pig power. Oh, you think she's or- starting to act? Yeah, as a radioactive pig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could be. I'm gonna go over my pig noise here. Spider pig. Yeah. Spider pig. She's able to chase chickens and eat garbage. Yes. And she's like all out of garbage. Could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I had another thing about that trip that I did. You guys? Oh yeah, we we stayed in one Airbnb. I want to see you guys think about this. We stayed in one Airbnb. It was the most expensive one that we had, and it did say in the in the thing it said uh it said one bathroom, three bedrooms for six people. When we got there, we have four kids. One's a 12-year-old girl. A 12-year-old girl needs her own bathroom. We got there in the master bedroom. There was a a bathroom door, but there was a code on it, and you could not unlock it. So we had one bathroom for the whole family. So I'm, like, texting the guy. I'm, like, there's another bathroom here? We can't have it? Can you open it? He's, like, sorry, it's dirty. We got it. I'm, like... Why do you, I, I just felt like I hadn't clearly known. And he's, like, hey, we told you there was one bathroom. I'm, like, yeah, but I've now been on, like nine of these with my 12 year old daughter and my other kids and you need two bathrooms when you have a family of six people yeah what do you think are you okay Ethan? I'm, i was frustrated <laughs> well maybe they had bodies or a meth lab in there yeah oh, i want to know that'd be a so blessing weird. that it was locked he's like we were clear i'm like but now that i know that it's there i'm mad so did you guys take the coast or did you just go up the five we didn't go exactly on the coast because we went to the our, the coast was our final destination yeah so we did like Ashland, uh, the the mountain outside Ashland. We did Grants Pass on the way back down. We did um, we stopped in Redding. Um, yeah, just kind of a lot of random stops, little cabins in the woods. Did you worship at Bethel Church, Redding? Did not. No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Get some gold dust. 
Anyway, that's, that's the trip in a nutshell. It was cool. I would get to see my long lost sister, everybody, my dad. So it's a big awesome. family gathering. Very cool. All right, so we get into our weekly news, or do you want to talk about your week at all? Do you do anything cool? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Weekly news. Every week there are stories. These are some of them. All right. And our first story of the week. It's um, it's always somber trying to make jokes in the midst of like very horrifying realities. I mean, this is the week. Um, I mean, this this is gonna this is gonna air in a, in a or air air is a funny word to use for yeah. podcasts. It's gonna come out in about a week from now, but the vinyl pressing is gonna come yeah. out in about a week here. <laughs> But yeah, so th- this is a, a week where the there was two horrible shootings in one day, and then there was another shooting just a few days before that. Um, so the first there was one in Gilroy, and then there was two. There was one in El Paso, and there was one in Dayton, and um, just horrifying everybody. I remember I sat at my computer just kind of in shock for like that whole night. Just I don't know why these ones hit me harder than most, and I and I don't know why I had I made the mistake of sitting there on Twitter and. Just getting more and more frustrated rookie, with the garbage people move, are saying. Man, rookie yeah, move. I should know better. And I and when these things happen, like I can't, I can't tweet about it. I don't know what it is. Like I'll try to write a tweet and stop, and it just seems so like it, it seems like there's a lot of people that it comes very natural to them to just suddenly start tweeting about things about government stuff or anyway. So eventually, the next morning, I pitched this headline. Study shows leading cause of gun violence is those you disagree with politically. And uh, that's, I mean, that just kind of encapsulated Twitter. It was just everybody, like you never hear, I mean, on on one side, I like not hearing the gunman's name or seeing his picture, but to constant, to just act as if he, he's just a puppet of the right wing or whoever it is that you hate. Uh, it really gets exhausting. It gets so exhausting. Yeah, and it's so inconsistent, you know, when the guy, when the gunman is on the opposite political side from you, you know, you immediately connect it to their ideology. Right. And you say, well, it was Trump for inciting, you know, with his inciting rhetoric or, you know, it was the left with their rhetoric. Yeah. It's like, hard for this us This is to, what you wanted, Trump. This has been, you know, and they <laughs> act like we haven't been having school shootings since the late 90s. Like I was in high school when... Uh, the one in Springfield happened, which everybody kind of considers, even though there had been ones before that, that was like the Kip Kinkle shooting was kind of the one that they, people feel launched, started all this. Columbine was next, but it's been going on for a long time. And it just, the, the short sightedness to act like uh, this just happened because of Trump. Sure. That, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre to really believe that that's really why. Yeah. Yeah. Very rarely is the response that people have to a shooting like this uh, introspection of like, what am I doing that what am I doing personally to love my neighbor that may yeah save us from something like this that was the one tweet that I did eventually tweet out and it was interesting because it's the it's the bible verse that you hear constantly and it seems like such a basic rule of life no duh Sunday school kind of thing love your neighbor and when I was looking at Twitter and I was looking at what was going on and how much hate and how this event had caused so much hate among people like I the two shooters were one was like hard right apparently from based on the manifesto that I keep seeing the word allegedly so I don't know if they linked it to him or not but that it was you know it was white nationalist Trump supporter the other guy was like pro Antifa left winger right both in the same day so everybody could like pick their shooter that they wanted to like you know I, I had pitched Helen where you could plaster their face in a baseball bat and just beat your political opponent to the death with them with that uh, with that which, whichever shooter you identify we didn't run that headline yeah we did not <laughs> 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 but <laughs> just the idea that we to, to, so much horror has already been created and now we're just beating we're just beating each other up i thought um there was there's been a couple instances of this but i, th- I think specifically after the ohio shooting there were um the ohio governor was giving an address and these protesters come in and they just start chanting do something do something you know and i thought it was a, a interesting portrait of our cultural moment that you have people that Rather than looking at themselves and and saying what is the evil in myself or in my movement that needs to be addressed, it was people looking to the government and saying, "What are you going to do about this? Not what 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 can I do about this?" And it's it's frightening in a way. I mean, but yeah, that's human nature. You know, you look at others, you look to your rulers, you say, "What can these people do?" Yeah, and to act like your hands are clean, like to just for this whole culture to act like their hands are clean. It's just a few lawmakers in Washington that have chosen not to enact. They act like it's so easy too. Oh, if there was just a few laws you just passed, yeah. we could just have all the guns taken away. 
It's like, to me, I always, there's, there's people that think, oh, just get rid of all the illegal immigrants and all, everything will be right. great. <laughs> on the other it's side, like, yeah, sure. Yeah, on the other side, it's like, okay, number one, that's nearly impossible. Like, how are you going to really do that? You'd have to have a, a, a overarching... Uh, a big magnet that pulls big, all... Big, giant, <laughs> yeah. It'd have to be a big, giant magnet that either can find illegal immigrants or guns. Yeah. <laughs> but we have to, I mean, you have to have like a Hitler-like authoritarian rule to pull something like that off. It's just... And there's always the one guy, hey, here's an idea, get rid of all the guns. There's always the Twitter guy that yeah. says that. It's like, yeah, good job. <laughs> You're yeah, what's smart. the thing? They always, they always <laughs> intro their tweets by saying... Um, this is simple. Yeah, this is simple. Or they'll conclude this tweet and say, "This is yeah." Or what, this isn't hard. Yeah, this isn't hard. Is well. and it's, it's like, like, well, maybe it is. How about this? <laughs> Guns have existed for a long, long time. Even the AR-15 has been around since the fifties. All this started, like that's the question that gets overlooked, like ignored. Like, what is it about our culture that has shifted so that suicides are rising and these killings that are like. They're narcissism killings. I mean, these people are all about themselves. There's a narcissism that's growing in in our culture, and uh, it, it coincides with the internet. And I'm not saying I have the answers, but those are the questions I want. When people talk about that, that's what I want to get into, and I want to understand. And those are the conversations that seem to be avoided the most. Anyway, that's yeah, a hilarious yeah. podcast. So funny. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to necessarily um, come down on these people who are chanting something like do something like I, I think it really speaks to this angst though that there's this yeah. there's this ache and this recognition that the culture is sick you mm -hmm. know but but the solutions and what do we do and who do we turn to those are the questions yeah yeah and I get it I get there there's a vis everybody kind of just goes to this visceral response in these situations and you know for some people it's just like if you're not into guns you don't you know if you don't understand gun culture you never around it you're just like, why the heck do we even have these things? Get rid of them all. You know, I, I totally get that gut reaction. Um, but yeah, it's just like, there's no, obviously we're not going to, we, we've started a giant topic for the, to start the show off with. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much to say. Yeah, just, We'll talk more about it in the subscriber portion or something. There's just so much to say. I don't remember my first, the first shooting, my first shooting was, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like as a kid, right? My first shooting. You might, the first shooting I really remember was Columbine. Yeah. And I, I don't remember. I mean, there wasn't obviously this widespread social media. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the discussion. Like, I don't remember if it immediately turned into gun control, you know, but it is interesting to me that whenever there's a tragedy, it's just instant, you know? Yeah. Back then, I mean, cause I was like in my early twenties when that all, well, when Columbine, I think I was around 18, 19, I was just out of high school, but the one in, uh, Thurston was the first you know, just a few kids technically that got killed, but a lot of kids got shot. Uh, and I lived just two hours away from that. So it was really close to home. But, um, but yeah, Columbine. Yeah, it was interesting. It was all about the video. That's one thing that people are saying, you know, there's people blaming video games again. That's what was the yeah, big blame the back then was right. video games and trench coats. Yeah, the trench coats. Yeah, yeah, they started banning those at school. I remember that. Yeah, they blame the trench coats. That's always that's the bizarre thing. We, we blame the the tool. Oh, it's the gun's fault. It's the trench coat's fault. Well, I think there's this helplessness, right? Because you see this horrible evil. Yeah. And you say, what are we going to do? You know, and, and you see the government taking action, even if it's meaningless, banning bump stocks after Vegas, you know, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. And it's like, a bump stock's really not going to yeah, yeah. make this worse or better. It's just something that we can point to. We need a scapegoat. We need you know? something to say. Let's just, yeah, just ban that and it'll all go away. Yeah. So if we just ban satire... Just ban satire. <laughs> That's all we need to do. So yeah. anyway, pray for the uh, pray for the communities. It's uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. Could like like Ethan was saying, doing humor at a time in the middle of a <laughs> yeah, trying shooting to get, is tough. It's and, tough, but you also really want to say so. stuff. There's stuff you want. There's points you want to make. Like one of the ones that we did do uh, a couple of days later, but was about just the idea of our culture. We embrace moral relativism. And then the moment something like this happens, everybody's tweeting in this moral absolutism. Yeah, this They're, is evil. This is this is absolutely evil, evil, unspeakable yeah. evil. Like I can't imagine anybody being like, well, relatively in another culture, you can imagine being be completely okay. moral that someone right. would walk into a school and shoot everybody. And that language just goes out the door, and it just begs the question: like, if you're just teaching people that you do you, good and evil are just words, good and evil are just points of view, but then suddenly something like this happens. Like, is there complicity in the idea of moral relativism in leading people to believe not only that we're like meaningless creatures 
we're just bacteria on the earth, uh, you know, and, and ultimately pointless existence. Um, and then also the idea of this, uh, you know, we're just evolved creatures or survival of the fittest, all that kind of stuff. And there is no true morality. There's no true good and evil. I mean, that's like general stuff. We're all kind of taught by our culture. And then when something like this happens, everybody's like, why are you evil? Anyway, yeah. that's the, you sound like, that's my frustration. You sound like a dark Lord of the Sith. <laughs> believing in absolutes. Absolutes. Yeah. You probably don't know that reference, but it's from Star Wars. Yeah. I, I got it. Cause you did a joke about it this week and I was like, oh yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Right. One of the great lines from the prequel. <laughs> the great lines. <laughs> Which is just, it's an brilliant, absolute, it's an absolute in itself. I love it. It is line. an absolute. Yeah. All, most of the, yeah. <laughs> Most things against absolutes are absolute statements. Yeah, which is interesting. Okay, so let's move on. Next story. Experts have warned that we only have 12 years left until they change the timeline on global warming again. So get ready. Because <laughs> in 12 years, the world... <laughs> The world will be the world will be flooded with new dates. New da- <laughs> new, new data. <laughs> new dates, yeah. <laughs> what, do you remember your first time you were told, like, given a timeline as a kid for when the world would end? I, I, you know, I don't even think we really were worried about global warming and climate change until Al Gore and the... Uh... No, because I remember when I was, like, probably 10. Okay. I remember being told that by the time I was an adult, there'd be no gasoline left. Oh. The world, there'd be... Well, be unli- I, the world would be unlivable. I, we were, I was told that in early, like in the late eighties. <laughs> well, I do remember that, but I wasn't specifically climate change. It was all the rainforests are going to be used up. Yeah, there'll be no more drinking water. It was it was definitely environmental alarmism, right? You know, and you remember that movie Fern Gully? Yes, yeah, that <laughs> that, was, that really like encapsulated shaped, shaped a generation, <laughs> encapsulated the whole. That, I mean, that's what we were taught in public school growing up all the time. Was yep. just this alarmism of. And to hate big business. Oh, the big log trucks. I, yeah, I always love that. <laughs> like there's the good spirits of the forest and then like this yeah. evil guy that's like, I'm going to cut down trees just, yeah. <laughs> just for fun. We were on our road trip. We drove through a, tons of trees, you know, up through Oregon and yeah. Northern California. And there was one mountainside that had been cleared out by log trucks or clearing out. And my daughter, of course, focuses in on that one. Oh my gosh, it's so terrible. They're tearing down. <laughs> Do you see all the trees that we've passed? And they grow. And they grow. More grow back. <laughs> I uh, I talked to a guy uh, up in Washington who deals with economic or uh, ecological issues, environmental okay. issues from a free market perspective. Interesting. Which is interesting because you don't really hear a lot of conservatives saying I care about the environment. Yeah. But one of the points that he made was um, the people that are passing laws for uh, about the environment live in big cities. Yeah. And then the people that have to follow them actually live out in the wilderness. Yeah, you know? <laughs> where it actually is, right? Yeah, because if you go around New York, it's a completely different. Like you get, you almost get why people are a bit insane on this topic. Yeah, when they start talking about pollution and overcrowding and overpopulation right. and all these things that come out of big cities. Well, yeah, in New York, all that's true. <laughs> I was up at I was up at a political conference there, and this um, this girl was was a uh, she owned she was like the third or fourth generation that owned a tree farm hmm. in in Washington, out in the middle of nowhere. You know, and and she was kind of like, look, we we don't follow, we don't really need to follow environmental laws because we take care of our trees anyway. She's like, because <laughs> if we don't, if we just destroy all the trees that we own, yeah, there's no trees for my kids, yeah. you know, and my grandkids. That's and true. So, like, what do loggers have to gain by yeah, wiping by all the trees out? By just being this evil guy smashing trees just <laughs> yeah. because. You I know? hate those trees. Yeah, and obviously there's some <laughs> there's some excesses that some corporations can yeah. go to in pursuit of profits. Yeah. You know, I just think that uh, I think sometimes it's so overblown. The climate change thing is interesting. You know, it's definitely on the left. It becomes a religious, you know, eschatology of here's the timeline. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> the end, yeah, the end the is doomsday. here. You know, I think Christians obviously can overreact. And a lot of times, totally. especially on the right, you know, we'll say it, 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 every mention of any climate change is a hoax, you know. Yeah. Or anybody, <laughs> yeah, anybody on the right, Christian or not, there's a there's a knee jerk. And, and to some extent, I get it. It's like, OK, so. If we created a, if, or if we had some scientific ev- evidence that it just so happened that you had to give all your money to Republicans and <laughs> right <laughs> and follow all of our laws, like do everything we say, 
then the, the, you'd be suspect if you were on the left. Well, yeah, <laughs> and that's what makes people suspicious yeah. is that it's never it's never just this cold scientific fact. Hey, guys, there's a problem. Yeah. We need to talk about solutions. It's, you know, there's a problem. Give all your money to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, if you and don't, it, you hate the world and you, you want know. to kill everybody. Yeah, give, give give control of the economy over to the government. It's always just hand in hand, and it really makes people suspicious, and they're yeah. really doing themselves a disservice. Yeah, and I, and I completely believe that there's a large amount of truth to the evidence for all this, but I also believe that just like growing up, we had all these giant warnings about what life, what, what the world was going to be like by the time I was the age I am now. Right. And, so, you know, there probably were some predictions that maybe were kind of right. But in general, technology changes, things change. Well, Later. I mean, it, and think about it from a marketing perspective, saying the world is going to end in 12 years if you don't right. vote for me. Right. It's a lot more effective than saying there's going to be some major changes coming to the climate in the next 100 to 200 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably more accurate, right? You know, water's going to rise. Yeah, I mean I, that seems to be the the part of it that seems to be the most uh, feasible. The water is going to be rising over time. We're going to have to adjust to that, as you know. But anyway, I'm no expert, and I'm yeah. not trying to pretend to be one. So basically, the liberals are lying to you about <laughs> climate change, <laughs> and you know, buy a Hummer. <laughs> this this uh, portion brought to you by General Motors. It's the uh, it's a topic brought to you by people that co- are, are always saying you should be more skeptical when it comes to things like your faith, <laughs> but then w- but then when it comes to this, the, no skepticism is allowed. Yeah, it's such a religious thing. It's so yeah. it's so wild. Museum of the Bible to display original golden tablets containing Jesus freak lyrics. This is an old article from 2016 or so. There's a lot going on here, you know, because <laughs> <Is this laughs> there actually was or is now a museum of the Bible. It wasn't quite open yet when this. Do they have golden tablets there? Is this a Mormon no. museum? <laughs> well, yeah. So then there's almost this Mormon element of the golden tablets, you know, that the Book of Mormon was supposedly handed down on. And then you've got Jesus Freak. There's just so much going on. This is a, a, real, layers. a real mishmash. So Jesus Freak, I mean, that was definitely the power anthem for the Christian kids growing up. The Christian 90s kid? Yeah. So yeah. we're each going to give our um, salvation story uh, when it, regarding Jesus Freak and DC Talk here. And then we're going to talk to Kevin Mack. So this is going to be a good little segue yeah, for little us. Yeah, segue. I, uh, I have an uncle and aunt, and my uncle's a uh, pastor. He's a Calvary Chapel pastor. I might have okay. mentioned him. I might have mentioned him before. I don't, I don't know, know if I know that. And um, growing up, they always gave me uh, my birthday every year. You know, I would say, oh, I want video games or I want, you know, whatever it was, Legos. Mm-hmm. And they would always give me something like... Like the Christian version? Not the Christian version, but they would give me like a Christian t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> or whatever. And so one year they gave me New Thang, the G- the DC nice. Talk album New Thang on cassette tape. Mm-hmm. And I think the following year they may have given me Jesus Freak, you know, on cassette or CD or something. And that was my introduction. And I remember New Thang, we listened to it over and over. We memorized all the raps. I can still, nice. I can still do you, them. You, you can know. do them right yeah. now? Let's hear it. I'm down with the one who is known as the sun. Nice. From the G to the O to the D, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> So. I was never that deep in. I was never really that into... Oh, sorry, you're still going. Toby so. Mac and the Mac is back, no slack on the DC track that's jacked. Is that old or new? Beyond comprehension. <laughs> I believe that I failed to mention that. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was... Uh, <laughs> so New Thing was like this... It was a pretty good album, but it was still... I mean, it still kind of reeks of early 90s. Mm-hmm. Reeks is probably the wrong word. It, it definitely was a product of it its time. It is right in that. Yeah, it's a product of time. Jesus Freak was, uh, to me, is like a timeless album. Yeah. I listened to it the other day. You know, it's just like, so good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's such a good album. There's so, That's good. Yeah. No, there's so many layers, you know. There's some, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not trying to completely knock it. I think I, I was so deep into that. Are you a skeptic? Are you a, <laughs> are you a Jesus freak skeptic? I loved it when it came out. I mean, I was like, well, I remember I was kind of in this weird spot because I had become a Christian only kind of recently. And I was like a little bit embarrassed to be getting into the, onto the Christian music stuff because I had grown up very secular music. And, uh, but I, I actually remember not wanting to like Jesus Freak and then I actually did kind of like it. And I was like, I really liked, and I, and I liked Kevin Max's voice a lot. Like I remember I really liked his voice. Um, I wanted to sing like that, but, uh, that was mainly it for me. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have a deep DC talk upbringing. I just, I remember when I was like around nine, my friend was listening to it. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's Christian rap. It's so cool. Yeah. And uh, 
he was explaining that DC stands for Deliverers of Christ, I think. That's decent Christian talk. Oh, is it? Yeah. He said it was Deliverers of Christ. I don't think. Is that not right? Deliverers of Christ. Well, yeah. I've carried that my whole life. Deliverers of Christ talk. We're, I mean, hold on. <laughs> now, now we got to find out Fact the real. Fact check. This is like fourth grade, 19. Uh, I like how the, we carry these rumors with us. 89 or something. Let's yeah, I was see. nine years old. 89. The name, okay, so they originally called DC Talk and the One Way Crew. The name was later simplified to DC Talk. But what's DC stand for? And then it says, which came to stand for Decent Christian Talk. Really? Though originally DC was from Washington, DC. Oh, it was from DC. <laughs> That's where really? Toby Mac was rapping. Huh. So apparently it comes from D. Well, you know, this is Wikipedia, so who knows? So originally, our, our Wikipedia oh, page this is, is Wikipedia. That's true. Yeah. You our don't Wikipedia page is not accurate. So. <laughs> That's fascinating. So originally it was a completely secular band name and then so, it got Christianified later. Tangent, but our Wikipedia page quotes some random guy like that <laughs> got quoted in some article and it says, even if a Babylon Bee story's intention is to entertain, the effect could still be misinformation if the headline is believable enough. <laughs> this random thing like Just calling random. us misinformation and fake news and stuff. Drop that in there. It's, it's like completely random in the Wikipedia <laughs> article. I don't even know who this guy is. Who is this guy? Yeah, so DC Talk, Jesus Freak, the album, like, I think it touched on a lot of cultural issues. Like, if you listen to lyrics to something like Colored People, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) which is like, (laughs) in itself, you like, look at a name like that, you're like, how do you get that on a Christian album? Yeah. You know, but it's, it's interesting to me that they were, they were willing to speak to these cultural issues that um, Christian music tended to play it safe on. I saw Jesus, I saw DC Talk live um, at the Pomona Fairgrounds. Oh, yeah? I think it was like the Jesus Freak tour, or it may have been just something after that. Well, it was like a time when everybody was a freak. Like they had like corn was around. Freak was a yeah. Freak on a leash. Freak. Everybody was some kind of freak. Like that was the cool thing was to be and to see yourself as an outcast and a freak. So I th- and I don't know if they I don't know if that just was like because they were in that time it just kind of naturally they created or if you know I don't know that they were capitalizing on it but that was just the that was the uh, spirit of the times. I'm a freak. It's like post grunge going into this like rap core era. Yeah. And I think there was this kind of nonconformist thing among the youth there always is. But I mean, in the nineties it was kind of, I think for me it really, you know, I I kind of uh, adopted that Jesus freak label and it really felt like, it felt like it was something like we're growing up and now I'm no, I'm no longer just doing my parents lame religion. Right. Now I'm a Jesus freak, you know? And it was, in some ways it, it kind of was true. Like it felt like Christianity was, you were playing along with society being a Christian when we were really young. It felt like yeah. it was a majority thing. And, and that was, at least in my experience, that was when culture kind of started to shift. And you really were being kind of punk rock if you still held your beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> and I really feel, I feel like it's, it's more punk rock now to be like a conservative yeah. Christian than <laughs> anything else right now. <laughs> I believe in God. <gasps> yeah. Though actually, you know, I say that, what but the president be? is a, is a conservative. So, or he's in name only. I mean, he's, he's, he's a Republican. Yeah, he's, a Republican. <laughs> he's flips a coin. He's whatever he is. Yeah. Flips a coin. That's Half right. of his face is boiled in acid. Hey, I pitched that headline. We're going to do it. <laughs> I'm waiting on the Photoshop, man. <laughs> All right. Well, so should we just get this into is a it? Good, so that's a good segue. So segue? If, so yeah, if you don't know who DC Talk is, they were huge uh, Christian rap, rock, grunge, alternative. I mean, I would say they defined a style of like yeah, they, an entire they, genre of Christian music. Yeah, I like, agree. And that was in the 90s. Kevin Max has then, uh, the, you know, they, the group split up after Supernatural, which was an album in the early 2000s. And uh, Kevin Max was one third of DC Talk. And he's done his own independent crazy music thing since then. He's just put out a ton of... Cranks out albums. Cranks out albums like quicker than the Beatles, you know, when they were pumping out four albums a year or whatever. <laughs> and um, and yeah, it's just really interesting guys. So we're about to have a cool conversation with him. And here it is. Presenting an exclusive Babylon B interview. Everybody, we are sitting down with a legend in the Christian music industry. His name is Kevin Max from the band. You might have heard of them. DC Talk. How you doing, Kevin? First of all, legend is uh, questionable, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing really good. And uh, yeah, man, I'm just on the road in my RV with my kids, um, living life, and uh, just kind of being the, the bohemian hippies that we are. <laughs> That's you know? awesome. So I've got a, I have a question, and we are hard-hitting journalists here at the Babylon Bee, and uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna take this easy on you. So right. Um, do you still love rap music? 
like very rarely do I listen to rap music and and even like back in the day um you know before I even w- became a part of DC Talk I was you know I was in the new wave you know in the 80s I was into Joy Division and and the Cure and David Bowie so when I joined in DC Talk I had no clue what was going on and so, uh so you were you- Yeah I never really Doug, I never really dug the, the the rap until I got to know you know the DC Talk scenario, and then I was like, okay, well, this is interesting. Yeah, I mean, so um, you, you know, I you, can't you say claim, that I love rap music. You claim yeah. you claim that you always have and you always will. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sing along with that song. I, I sang the choruses, but I didn't I didn't write the song. So there's yeah. there's that at least. But um, yeah, you know, there's certain types of rap music actually even today that I like. You know. I'm kind of a, a fan of uh, Snoop Dogg. Like gangster you know? rap? You like really um, hardcore gangster rap? I, I don't even know if it's hardcore gangster rap. Is, is like Lil Wayne hardcore gangster rap? I, I guess know. he is, right? I'm not the authority on gangster rap. <laughs> Straight out of Compton. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Did you, they ever pressure you to rap more in DC Talk? They're like, Kevin, come on, man, rap more. We're, ra- we're rapping. Yeah, they knew better than that. They never, <laughs> They never asked me to do that. Essentially, the only you know rapper that I even knew, um, T-Bone. you know, at that time. I mean, go I was ahead. guessing the only rapper you knew was T Bone. Do you know T Bone? I, I didn't know him either. I, like I, I, I think I met him a couple of times at some festivals, like when we were starting. But um, honestly, like I didn't even know like anybody famous, like Run DMC or anybody like that. So uh, Toby was like the first one I ever met, and I was like, okay, this rap thing. I guess it. I guess it's successful and people like it. Yeah, because I remember when I was like nine uh, when I first heard DC Talk, and you guys, you guys d- uh, definitely did that. It was kind of like that Fresh Prince style of rapping. It was like the early nineties. Yeah, Beastie Boys. Well, I guess so. you guys were in the late late eighties. You guys got going, right? Yeah, Beastie Boys. It was actually yeah, we formed in eight like eighty seven, eighty eight. So yeah, Beastie Boys, Run DMC. Uh, I think for Toby too, he was like he was like uh, picking from um, LL Cool J's kind of mm. vibes too. You know, it's like a lot of different things going on. Like I said, I was, I was into rock and roll. So it was really strange for me to show up in this, you know, amalgamation of a hip hop, pop, whatever it was at the beginning. Uh, I just kind of went along with it, man. It was fun. So we got to dress in, in, in matching outfits and wear <laughs> patent leather shoes and, and learn dance moves and stuff. So what what did people think when they heard that you were a Jesus freak? Oh man, who, who writes these questions? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was we're just trying to source your actual lyrics and and yeah, I was curious. Yeah. Did, um, what did they think? Did they think how it go? Oh man, how'd that end up? Wow, I'd have to go back to ninety uh, mid nineties on that one. I think they thought we were crazy, and uh, you know the 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 record label at the time. Um, you know, when we signed with Virgin, I mean, they were, they were big into the song, you know, and they thought that, Hey, this is going to be cool. Cause it, this could, this could actually work in the general market as well. And, uh, that's why we had this guy named Simon Maxwell do the video and he had uh, done videos for Nine Inch Nails and a lot of other general market acts. And, and so I think we were, you know, that everybody was caught up in this grunge movement, whereas we were kind of a band that kind of played to a lot of diff- different styles on one album. So that was just one song, and then there were several other uh, elements on the album that didn't necessarily go as heavy in, into the grunge category as that did. But yeah, when we first started playing that song, I mean, it was it was an immediate like polarizing reaction. I think hmm. either people really dug it or they had no clue what was going on. That was that was more thing. of a new thing than new thing. It was um, new things. At one point, at what point in the writing of Jesus Freak did somebody suggest the lyric? Ha ha ha. That one. You, you do that? Is that yours? Uh, that was actually me impro- improvising, yes. Nice. And I don't even know if that's can be, you that know, I don't know if that's categorized as a lyric. It's more like a background yeah, part. It's like but, a, uh, uh-huh. that, was, that was me improvising on in the moment. That was kind of like my wolf howl back then. <laughs> you know, I used to kind of howl during the shows, too. And so I had a limited amount of time that I could howl on that track. So it, it became clipped, you know, Yeah. more like oh, 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 more, less howling than just kind of barking, really. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's great. I'm glad that we just got you to do the how, how, how on <laughs> on the air. It's very small. <laughs> that was our one goal here. I could do it for real, but it might, you know, Freak it might it. it might distort in the phone. I'm not sure. 
Yeah. You, uh, hey, I'm willing. If you're willing to try, I'll. I'll we, we would love that. I'll hold my headphones away from my ears a little bit. Let's see how this one goes, and then <laughs> okay. if people want to hear another one, then then I'll I'll, I'll let it rip. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I heard you live on a farm in Tennessee. You still live on a farm? I don't. I I owned a farm for a year and a half. Oh, that was we really tried nice. the farm life. We 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 bought a uh, a horse farm. We had we had three horses, and uh, I grew up riding horses. I grew up I grew up in Michigan. My my dad had like a hobby farm growing up, and so I wanted to try out the farm thing, and uh, it didn't go very well. I just I, I spent most of the time in the, in the recording studio, and my wife would always come over and say, "Hey, have you fed the horses yet?" And I'm like, oh, crap, you know, and hey, have you, uh, you know, cleaned out the the horse stalls yet? Oh, crap. (laughs) And so it was like a never ending, you know, hey, have you done this? And I'm like, oh, crap. So I uh, I decided that (laughs) it was a bit too much responsibility. But but the the real honest, serious reason was that it was an hour um, and 15 hour and change away from Nashville or Franklin or anything. Mm-hmm. And so we were really out there. We were out in the middle of nowhere on the top of a hill, mm-hmm. actually in a little town called Centerville. It just became really tough for my wife to kind of go back and forth with all the kids. I've got four kids. And then also keeping up on the horses. Yeah, four kids um, and then throw some horses and some pigs and donkeys and whatever else you had out there. That's a lot of work. We had no pigs. We had okay. no donkeys. I was uh, at a farm recently and a, some, a pig bit my daughter just the other day. Just throwing wow. that in there to, as, for conversation. It was crazy. She was traumatized. I guess it could be aggressive, yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks so nice. It had a big smile on its face. She petted and then it bit her. So on your farm, I'm just curious, did you have a rooster on your farm? <laughs> uh, no. no. Rooster? Just, pu- just No roosters. No. See, I was hoping that the rooster would go. Well, actually, I guess you could we do just it. Had, You could do the ho, ho, ho we, in the morning. We had an alarm that would go off, um, I think, through a cellular phone, which woke us up. I think that's how we got up on the farm. Oh, really? You had a, a cellular phone that just beeped for everybody? I, I think I think it played Jesus Freak in that what? section. <laughs> it did the ho ho, really? That's a really great idea, though. <laughs> like, I think I'm I'm going to try to see if there's a section of that song I could I could uh, make into an alarm. That would yeah, be amazing, or ho-ho. like a ringtone, right? Yeah, the ho ho would be a great ringtone. I was curious, just like some political questions. Yeah, you want to get political? <laughs> it's a great idea. We have a lot of random questions written down here. If Kyle can handle the politics, I'll, I'll go for it. You know, we didn't write any down. Now go for, no, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm a fan of the bee, so you know. And you I'm, have I'm described here. yourself as more. Keep more, going. You've described yourself as more progressive and as a Christian goth hippie. So that impresses me that you would like wow. to be. See, I've done my digging. So would you? Yeah. Like, as yeah, a, you have. as a Christian goth hippie, does the bee ever rub you the wrong way? No. Well, you're Actually, in Nashville. Never really. I mean, you know, if you guys went more the po- Republican route, that would bother me. Well, we've been called far definitely... right by many people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the, the more kind of right wing conservative you become, I'm, it's going to kind of see me further and further in the rearview min- window. But mm-hmm. you know, because I'm kind of I'm kind of left, I guess. Yeah. I, mean, um, the... I, I tell I tell people that I'm not very political. I'm you know I'm 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 into political anarchy. I'd love to have absolutely no presidents. Oh man! Um, Speaking my way, no government. Yeah. Li- <laughs> I think we kind of everybody almost... live on a hippie farm. Ah, uh, yes, I'm in, I'm down. <laughs> We're all gonna move to Kevin's hippie farm. This is awesome, Kevin. For yeah, president. and see, everybody goes, "Oh, he's socialist," and I'm like, "No, I'm just being social. Take the <laughs> ist out of it." Well, yeah, I mean, isn't there a difference exactly. between the government forcing you to do that and you going yeah, to do it Yeah, if we're all doing it freely, that's way <laughs> yeah. different if the government's forcing us all to. If you go freely, it's called it's called utopia. Man, I like that. Or complete anarchy. Yeah, cool. I, I think the B is not trying to necessarily be like Republican or conservative. It's trying to make fun of the whole process. Yeah, we're just so I, so I could see, it all. I could see why that would resonate with you. No, um, that's good. Satire is beautiful. We need more of it. So Especially you, in... And I don't consider myself in Christian music anymore as a solo artist, but as a member of DC Talk, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it, Christian music meet, needs so much satire just to kind of, you know, balance it out. It needs to be so satirical that every artist becomes like Steve Taylor overnight just to kind of balance <laughs> it out, you know? Well, it's funny the way things have shifted over time because I think uh, it w- there was a time when Christian music was considered very, very sacred. Like I, I remember the days when people were burning their secular music and just, you know, 
they'd keep DC Talk but burn the other CDs. And uh, wow, I, I was that's what made me. Curious. I never heard of that. I never heard whatever. of those times. Man. You heard of that? <laughs> no, I did. But that's I, what I, I was don't curious. Know like, actually did that. That's crazy. Oh yeah, I uh, my youth group growing up had a a program where you could bring in secular CDs and they would give you like Jesus Freak or Newsboys or. Audio adrenaline, and then in play, and then they had a big That's bonfire. That's horrible. There was a big bonfire at the end of the summer. I mean, That's like an Ari Aster film. Like, um, I think God, I think God made all music. He he put a copyright copyright on it at the very beginning. So yeah, well, he made all the people that make all the music. You know, I mean, it's all thing. God's creation. Exactly. Um, you yeah, could say Ozzy Osbourne is not as sacred as DC Talk. You know, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I was kind of curious to talk about. Like. How have things shifted in, Christ, in Christian music since those days? It does seem like the the dichotomy between secular and Christian music, it's died down a bit. And that's one reason we can laugh, look back and laugh on it a bit now, because I don't see it quite as divided as it used yeah. to be. Yeah, it's not as black and white for sure. I mean, as a solo artist, I started out in 2001, kind of on my own, moved to L.A., didn't re- kind of left Christian music. So I haven't been doing making Christian music quote unquote albums since the very beginning as a solo artist. But, you know, as somebody that, you know, does the the DC talk shows here and there, and I am a DC talk member, so I'm one third, you know, mm-hmm. I'm the K in DC talk. I, it, they, they do pull me back in and I'm like, I think it's changing for the better. Yeah. I haven't followed uh, I mean, I'm, I'm like really old fashioned. So I listen to really old music all the time. So I have not kept up on what all the kids are listening to these days. My kids will turn stuff on. I'm like, turn it off. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually one. They, my kids love Imagine Dragons, and you oh, know, yeah. it, it, it's it sounds like CCM to me. I'm yeah. like, yeah, kind of all sounds the same. I, I was gonna say that that's one reason that I actually liked the Jesus Freak album is it was so it was such a huge shift. I feel from this era where everything was this really explicit, maybe really tame worship mm-hmm. album like it's really explicitly mentioning god and jesus and not that jesus freak didn't i mean not jesus is in the name of the album but <laughs> you know but there's there, there's there's songs on there that aren't you know necessarily just you know jesus is good jesus is great well, the, you know? yeah the, the heart of that record is what if i stumble which is basically talking right, about right. being a human being and messing up and not having all the you know yeah. having your having your stuff together and realizing that you need uh you need a savior so, yeah, yeah, I, th- yeah. I think a lot of music comes from this place of like struggle and questioning, you know, and I feel like you, you can feel that in the album and, and it's really great. I used to sit alone in my car and try to do that. What if I fall? <laughs> like all that crazy <laughs> note changing that you do. I used to try and really I'd belt it out. I can... Hey, you know that Ryan um, from uh, One Republic, what's his, what's his last name? Ryan uh, Tedder. He does a really good Kevin Max impersonation. In oh, fact, yeah. he invited us to watch him open up for you too and we all flew down to hang with him and backstage before he went on stage with you too he did his kevin max impersonation and he actually sang what if i stumble that's the one he did <laughs> that's awesome and it was amazing dude i got it on i got it on tape i mean it's somewhere <laughs> on youtube i'm curious about you guys work with carmen on a song called addicted to jesus and just i just want to hear about that experience <laughs> I want stories. Oh, I want stories. Again, like, you know, I was kind of like a, a chorus singer um, back mm-hmm. in those days. I do not know who put those two acts together. I just knew that I was kind of all of a sudden in this video. And, you know, I didn't know much about Carmen. I, 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 I'll be honest, like, I I didn't know hardly anything about him. Mm-hmm. Um, the only Christian artist that I ever really knew much about was, like, Amy Grant and... Uh, Michael W. Smith, because they were kind of everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but Carmen, I didn't, I didn't know anything about him, and I, I'll have to just be really gut honest and not try to be cool because everybody would want to be cool when they answer this question, you know, because it's the Babylon Bee and they want to be cool and everything. But <laughs> I'll just say that I was so young, I just didn't even know. Like I was kind of like, I, mean, I didn't know if he was like, like the brand new. I don't know. Give me a, 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 an example in the general market. I guess uh, Weird Al. <laughs> or is that brand new <laughs> yeah the brand new weird you know i just didn't know it's kind of like oh okay we're gonna do this strange song and and i remember very vaguely vaguely that whole thing and you know yeah it's 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 cringy to me when i when i when i see it or hear it and i usually don't let it go all all over my pages but <laughs> um i will say that you know we were young and 
we were just having fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Carmen, it, 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 it's really funny to me how you answered that. And you said you just all of a sudden were in this video. <laughs> Appeared there. Like I, we get, we get this feeling. Yeah. I mean, we get this feeling. It, like I was just the, transported there. No, no, no. I mean, it really, literally, <laughs> no, I, I probably you. picked up by management in a, in a, in a van and yeah. driven to a location. And then I'm in this video, right? Yeah. And did it's you, like, did you meet, did you meet Carmen at all? Did you talk to him? Oh yeah, yeah, we met him. Actually, you know, strangely enough, I think we did one festival show with him, and we were supposed to jump on stage and do that song. I mean, of course, this was really early '90s, and uh, he ended up leaving the festival <laughs> <laughs> over some, you know, discrepancy. He pulled he pulled out of the show, so mm. we didn't have the opportunity to yeah, so do I, the addicted I, to Jesus I thing. Mean, I, yeah. I, just, I just love this image of the band doing all this stuff, and Kevin's just getting dragged around and. You know, you're just trying. Yeah. To, you're just trying to be creative and, and yeah. write all this poetry. And there's the guys stand, just like, stand what? here and try to act like a beastie boy. All right, so you're doing a lot of you're doing a lot of stuff now, and it's way different from the stuff that you did in DC Talk. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about you know where you're going creatively with your current stuff? Like I said, I mean, in, in DC Talk, I was kind of the oddball and the misfit in the very beginning, but I think that's what kind of made that the, the group really cool is the fact that it was three very different individuals with three different musical tastes. And I think you, people that have followed us from the beginning as solo artists can see how different those albums really are from artist to artist. I just, I guess I'm letting people know that, that I am out there making music. Uh, and a lot of people thought I disappeared after 2001. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, he's still making music. I'm trying to get people to realize you know, I've made 15 albums since 2001. A lot of them are, are, are under the alternative, whatever you want to call that genre. But um, I, I love rock and roll. I love experimenting just at a synth wave record. So I'm trying to get people to come investigate what I've been doing. And I put together a record called Black Sheep of the Fold, which is a collection of my songs from 2001, my first album, Stereotype B, all the way to this newest record I just did called Romeo Drive. Yeah, so people can get a chance to kind of listen to what I've done if they check out Black Sheep of the Fold. It's on Spotify. And then uh, the Romeo Drive, which is a synthwave record being made into vinyl by a company called Old Bear Records in tandem with Light in the Attic. So we're putting that out on vinyl. The newest thing I'm doing right now is the Revisiting This Planet, um, a cover of Larry Norman's Only Visiting This Planet. Really kind of like a Bob Dylan protest record from 1972. Um, Larry was, you know, a pioneer and um, was a friend of mine. And so I'm, I'm able to make really, really cool, fun music, and I'm wanting people to check it out. So check, check, check me out <laughs> at kevinmax.com. And thank you, Babylon B, for letting me sell my wares. I, I think it's really interesting when you have a band like DC Talk, you could keep going for 20 years and keep releasing the same record over and over. But for you guys to kind of end it yeah. when you did, and then you go and do something that you're a lot more happy with creatively, I, I almost think that's a better way to go. Yeah. Well, it's like the police. You know, the police ended at the very top of their career. You know, and then Sting went and made all the, made all his albums, and um, Stewart started making soundtrack music and and they seem to be pretty happy and they stopped when they were on top you know really it wasn't like the police could have absolutely kept going you know but um they, i think they just kind of hit their their canopy as we did at that time too um but i, I feel like dc talk has has got has got a few more albums in us we'll, we'll see Ooh, i mean whoa that's whoa any rap core quote unquote talk oh my gosh I was hoping at some point you guys would go full rap core because you never quite did. You had Toby like I know we never screaming. did that. Yeah, I know. No, Toby Rage. needs to. Toby needs to rap more. And I told him after this last uh, boat trip we took um, boat. together. Boat. I like boat on, <laughs> on the carnival. <laughs> you know, on a small boat that where people can like you know, <laughs> like rock climb right next to a, <laughs> a jet ski thing on on board a boat. You know. Yeah. It, yeah, I had to go to the restaurant one night with my family, and it was like walking through a Cool Springs Galleria um, <laughs> on this boat. It was, it was, it was amazing. It's the hugest thing I've ever been on. But uh, I told Toby after I think it was like the second or third show, I just said, "Man, I, I just I, I want to hear you, you know, doing the hip hop thing more because it's he's so good at it, you know, mm -hmm. he's so great at it." And then of course my friend Michael Tate has got one of the best voices in the world. He used to sing more. Um, and we are doing a Christmas 
duet song together. See, I'm still pushing my stuff. You let me, yeah, you let, you let, you open that door. Work it all in. And I'm pushing it. So, so Michael <laughs> Tate and I are doing a, a <laughs> duet Christmas song this year. Is it Baby yeah. It's Cold Outside? Baby It's Cold Outside. <laughs> he's na- he's Nat he's na- he's na- King Cole and I'm Frank Sinatra, kind of, <laughs> you know, pseudo. I like it, yeah. Yeah, you Kevin Max pushing, right, stuff, thank- pushing stuff like a used car salesman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, well, if people want to follow you or see what you're doing, where can they find you? KevinMax.com. Pretty Perfect. simple, right? Um, yeah. You got that. You got uh, that. Yeah, I'm on, oh, I'm on Twitter, and I'm following you guys on Twitter. Ooh. And I follow Kyle, too. Nice. I'm on Twitter. Yeah, come on, follow me. Come under uh, Kevin Max. I'm going to follow you right after this. Yes. As, soon as, as soon as I park the, the RV tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Great. I'm on all those things. All right, well, Spotify. Well, uh, thanks, for joining, <laughs> thanks for joining us, Kevin. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so yeah, much. Man, thank you, guys. Have a good trip with your family. Enjoy your Chipotle. Thank you so much. Appreciate right. it. See you. Okay, bye. And that was part one of our interview with Kevin. It uh, it went a little long because we uh, we got so excited to talk about all sorts of crazy different things, like Carmen and New Thang, and so we talked more. And that's going to be in the subscriber portion. Uh, so subscribe if you want to hear that part. All right. Well, what do you think of that interview, Kyle? Was that pretty cool? I, I... I'm a little starstruck still. <laughs> like I was a little nervous talking to, I know, I know I'm supposed to be like this professional podcast host, but I'm, I'm like talking to one of my childhood heroes. So <laughs> for me, if he had talked the way he sings, if he was like, ah, da, 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 I can't do it, but <laughs> I, I'd feel more threatened because I'd feel more like, because when he talks, he doesn't sound like that. I'm in a Winnebago. Yeah. Yeah. What if I fall? yeah. I can't what? do it, but. Yeah, or if uh, if as I was trying to talk, he kept interrupting me by going, "Oh, yeah, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah." That would be hard. It's really interesting how he's all real of, laid back. All of our idols, like growing up, are like normal people. I mean, yeah, it's weird. It's almost like it's uh, almost like everybody's just, just normal people. Person. Yeah, yeah it's just people. Weird. So that's a lot. That's a, that's enough on that topic. We're gonna move on to hate mail. Hate mail. So uh, um, here's the jingle. I really miss Adam Ford. That, oh, that yeah. is, you like that jingle? <laughs> that's the jingle, man. Yeah. All right. So this is one of our favorite hate mails. We've been trying to work this one in. Yeah. I don't even know. It's it's hard to say if it's a hate mail or not. Yeah. It's love. Hate? It's a it's it's a mysterious mail. Yeah. So here's here it is. Some of your postings are wonderful. Some are awful. Keep it up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hold it together. You lost it. Some of your postings are wonderful. Some are awful. Keep it up. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> I love this, uh, <laughs> the format of this review is just great. So I, we, we did some Googling, uh, cause, cause I love that she says, or is it a she or a he, you remember? I think it was a, a lady. I think lady it was a lady. Folk. Yeah. But. And she says, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing. Even though some of your stuff is completely awful and I hate it. <laughs> I really like that she. It's almost like she actually. <laughs> and likes, there's even an exclamation point. It, Keep it up. It's like she actually likes the mix of really bad and really yeah. good stuff we put out. Yeah, like don't be all good. Like don't you ever change. Don't Babylon raise your quality theme. at all. Keep being half <laughs> awful. <laughs> so we yeah we, so like Ethan was saying we actually found some uh, other reviews that this po- person has posted. Yeah, she's posted a bunch of Yelp reviews. Um, like here's one she left at a restaurant that serves fish. Apparently, this restaurant has amazing tilapia. It gave me food poisoning, and I vomited until 3 a.m. Five stars. Um, so her apparently her vet uh, or her dog got sick, and so she left this review of her local vet. She says, I took my dog to this vet, and they took excellent care of her, though they did put her to sleep without my permission. Highly recommended. <laughs> and I think it was a five-star. It's probably a five-star, yeah. Review. Sounds like it. She really yeah. is happy. Uh, Uber. My Uber driver's car was clean and smelled great. He drove like a blind man with scorpions in his undergarments. Great driver. Yeah, you definitely give that guy five stars. Five stars. He, he and a tip. And a tip, for sure. Yeah. The AC repairman fixed my AC. He also stole my television and kidnapped my family. Keep it up, guys. <laughs> five stars. That's another five star. Yeah. I think it is overall I'm inspired by her uh, her attitude. So she goes to place. It's not all great, but she still is very positive about it. Yeah, five stars. Five stars. It That's is, a good way to live. I do see reviews like this on Amazon a lot where someone's like, this is not the product that it claimed to be, you know, did not do what it was supposed to, broke in two months, and they're like four out of five. Yeah. I'm like, what? where's the four? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen a couple of our reviews in our podcast like that where they like, they say all this negative stuff and it's five stars. I'm like, oh, all right. 
I think there are different review cultures depending on the <laughs> platform. Like some some places, everybody just gives five stars. You see that yeah. on Amazon a lot. It's always four and five, four and five. Yeah. And unless someone really hates you, they're not dipping down to three. You know. Yeah, it's always like really controversial books. You know, it's like an Ann Coulter book. It's yeah. all ones and fives. Yeah. Yeah. The the fans and yeah. the and the haters. Yep. Well, speaking of haters, all you haters that uh, do not subscribe to us yet. Um, yeah, we're done with you. We're done with you, and we're going to go into our secret lounge. We're going to go into the Platinum Room now. Yep. And uh, we're going to cut it off here, and we're going into our subscriber-exclusive segment. So if you'd like to hear the rest of the podcast, you got to go to babylonb.com slash plans. You can sign up for any amount starting at $5 a month, and uh, you get access to extra content every week, which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's really cool. And also uh, we've, we've, I don't know if we've, uh, we've integrated the podcast into the website a bit more since, uh, it's a little better now. Yeah. yeah. It's a little better now. You can go on there and you can list all these on there. We got an app coming soon. So, all kinds uh, of fun stuff. all sorts of stuff. So yeah, in the meantime, we'll talk to you guys next week until then. Ho, ho, ho. Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee, reminding you to go forth and punch Satan in his stupid face. 